So we had to really create like a ground rule to make sure that like if we were ever using a foliage uh, to protect the player, that it was like a really dense, meaty looking uh, tree or shrub and, and it would believably block bullets. In this episode of the FICA sessions, we will meet lead level designer Michael Howe and learn all we can about designing levels for video games. Hey, Michael. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you very much. You brought Fika. I bought Fika. You did. I always bring Fika. Well, that's I did. Not, as much as I can. As much as I can, yeah. It's a good, it's a good Swedish tradition by now. So, what did you bring, though? I bought the, uh, I'm going to do my best to pronounce it, the Canyobula. <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. Cinnamon buns. Yeah. These are kind of the classic. I was just actually listening to a podcast where they talked about Canyobula, Swedish. And the Americans seem super confused about this, like with the sugar on top and stuff. Okay. Seems typical. We even have a special Swedish day for these. So. That's actually what, I mean, there was a guy I work with who was religious about the days bringing in the fika, and it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. It was so cool. Yeah, really good. Yeah. So you work here uh, at Massive Entertainment as lead level designer. Correct. What does, on a top level, what does a level designer do? It's in the title, I guess. Yeah. Uh, level designers uh, have been famously described as uh, architects of fun or you are in a job where the rubber meets the road. So right. you've got a lot of departments who are supporting you to deliver the player experience in a way because uh, you're using software and tools to bring everything together to right. create the player experience. So uh, a good analogy would be a level designer is creating... Um, a house and designing the architectural blueprint of the house, uh, but he's not going to paint that house. He's got right. texture artists to support him and AI people to to program the AI. And and the, but the level designer will put those AI in and decide how they kill you within that house, um, <laughs> that's, which which is quite fun. That's a great way of putting it, I suppose. But first of all, before we get into the more details about level design, I just want to find out a little bit more about you because how did you end up in Malmo? Of all places. How did I end up in Malmo? Um, I guess like for me, I, I've been driven to work with cool studios. Um, so uh, Ubisoft is in Malmo. Uh, I was a big fan of Ubisoft's game. So it, it was for me a little bit of like wanting to work with the studio right. uh, and also just seeking adventure. Uh, so I think I, I, I follow adventure wherever I can and I wanted to check out Scandinavia. Uh, so it was a good fit for me to to join the studio, make some incredible games, and and go on some new adventures. Right. So where have you been before you came here? Uh, I was working in the UK for a while, uh, and also working in Australia initially. Right. Okay. So let's jump into level design because I'm I'm really interested in in finding out more because it's one of those aspects. You know, it's just there. You yeah. just play the game, and the levels are there, but it's so so intricately tied to the entire experience, of course. So where, when the development of the game actually starts, yeah. when do you guys come in? Like, at what point are the level of designers brought in? I guess it depends on the studio. Like, sometimes uh, there can be higher expectations for level designers. Uh, there's actually, like, like sub-branches of level design as well. Like, you can have technical level designers. You can, you can have traditional level designers. Um, and then there's some level designers are actually expected to be game designers as well. Right. Um, but but ultimately, it would as a true blue sort of salt of the earth level designer, mm -hmm. uh, you'd be coming into a project, I guess, when the the core vision and the pillars of the game are defined and established, and you're trying to execute on the high level vision. Maybe the the locations have already been chosen, and you get a brief which is saying there's going to be a, you know some kind of mission to undertake in this area. And then your job would be to start to reference and understand that area, think about what kind of good gameplay goals could go on in that space, collaborating with narrative and, and art and everyone on the vision for, for what you want to deliver. And then you could actually start to prototype some of the spaces and, and, and bring a high level vision for that space together. Yeah, because that's one of the things as well, like how do you work with game design? Like Because those parts are so intricately uh, attached to each other again. Like, how, how does a game designer and a level designer work together? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, we typically work closely together to, to make sure that we're aligned, specifically when, 
I mean, you've got a game with a lot of moving parts. The game designers have a really in-depth understanding of all the different ways that decisions can, can affect the overall experience. So you, you might have a progression designer or a, a 3C designer or the AI designer, and all these people are going to be working with the level designers, making sure that they understand how the decisions they're making can affect those other moving parts. Right. Uh, and and I, I think in particular, we have a very close collaboration with the, the AI designers because in a way we're designing a space which works well for the player to move through, but also for the artificial intelligence to move through right. and, and kill you in interesting ways. So it's almost like when you're designing a space, you want to jump into the AI's shoes for a second and, and move towards the, the player and think, could I, if I was trying to kill the player, yeah. could I do it in an interesting way and you know, understanding the, the logic of those AI and what, what they're going to be drawn to through their behaviors is, is really helpful. Yeah. So how, how do you start with that kind of flow? Like from which direction, which angle do you start from? I think like you start kind of very high level, like more reference gathering and understanding mm -hmm. the space, um, so that you what you deliver on needs to feel. I, it depends on the game, obviously, but in a lot of the the realistic open sandbox shooters that I've been involved in, uh, it needs to feel quite realistic and 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 it'll have a foundation in architecture. So we start with a lot of reference gathering, understanding the space, what it might look like in real life, and getting a feel for it. Maybe we just jump on Google Earth and, and throw the little man down and wander through the streets. I've done that for like a Transformers level ages ago to understand what the favela districts were like. Because yeah. uh, so, I had a, a multiplayer level that was going to be in that dense jungle of favelas. So it's it's really trying to understand a little bit what it, what it feels like, even a little bit high level architecturally, before you start to either put uh, pencil to paper and start to sketch some ideas, or you could jump into SketchUp and, and maybe just explore a little bit what the space feels like at, at a very high level. Right. So how do you work with realism that way? Like, because the difference in, in making, you've worked on more fantastical games, like Star yeah, Wars yeah. games, for example, and then going to, to a realistic setting. Like, how can you affect the realistic setting in a, in a way that, that provides good gameplay opportunities? Like, you need to have a pretty rigid set of what you can do, yeah. but you can still create fun levels. Like, how, how, how do you work in that kind of environment? I, th I think it's through really good collaboration, like uh, because we have people who are so talented and, and so aware of like these spaces, like from an architectural point of view, our artists are really sort of driven and focused and they've got these beautiful in-depth law books and things like that that they're researching. So they're going to have a really good understanding. So I think through collaboration with them and understanding through them, like what is super key to this space? Like what are the almost fixed points that I can't, you know, modify, right. um, the, then once you've got a groundwork where you can go, okay, these are some of the rules I can bend or break, and these are the ones that are really important to the space, then you can start to go, how do I create something fun um, yeah. within that space? So how does, uh, you, you were talking about the like open world sandboxes, and also like comparing to, to games with individual set levels, yeah. you're supposed to jump, like in a 3D game, or 3D platform, you're supposed to jump from platform to platform, yeah. it's fantastical, to go to uh, the realism that we just talked about. Like, How do you transition over from open world to an actual gameplay level? Yeah. Like, does that make sense? Like, For example, in, in, in a certain game close to our hearts, you go from the street and then into like an historical building, like how do how does that transition work from uh, from an open world into an actual level? Like, what do you have to take into consideration? I guess it depends on the the technical constraints of the game. Um, of course, I mean we've certainly got a, a lot outside when we're working on a. A division game. Uh, we actually compartmentalize the outside world and the inside world because we want to make sure when you get inside those spaces that they're they're very realistic and the attention to detail is high. Um, but I guess ultimately, like no matter the game you're you're working on, you're just trying to create something that's really fun and different and interesting for players or subvert their expectations. So, is there anything in particular like a good level designer needs to take into account? no matter what level they are creating? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, I guess the, I mean, for me, the the player experience is, is, is king. So the, the most important thing for me is to really be thinking about the player and, and the audience right. that I'm making the game for and, and what's going to create an incredible experience for them or maybe what 
might be a little bit different or varied for, for them as well. Like, I think sometimes it can be easy to, to fall into a formula and you know that the, the formula is, is quite safe uh, and, and it creates a, a fun experience. But then it's like, how can you just put a little bit of special sauce on that to tweak it? Yep. And then the, the player comes in maybe expecting one thing and then you change it and all of a sudden something incredible is happening that they didn't expect but it's within the same kind of confines and, and rules that they understand from, yeah. from the game. It's just this definition of fun, right? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. That's got to be really tricky to deal with. I guess so. Uh, I mean, because everything, like almost in terms of a, a movie, can contribute to fun. Like even fun can be not fun if there's too much of it. And that's a strange thing to say, right? But yeah. like pacing for a level designer is really important. And if, if you have a fun experience, which is like a, a high intensity combat beat, but then that just repeats and repeats and repeats, uh, it's not gonna be a fun experience for players. But then if you vary the experience, almost like the pace of a film where, where like there's calm after the storm. So I have something intense, and then afterwards, uh, you know, it br builds in maybe more of a narrative moment, or it, it builds something which is uh, all, focused around uh, a completely different action, traversing, moving around in a completely different way, challenging the player to completely step into a different set of verbs to, oh, okay, I've just been firing away or doing something like that. Now, oh, the game is asking something completely different of me. And mm -hmm. that keeps the experience fresh, yeah. uh, which is really important. So during the flow of a mission, you mentioned narrative parts. Like, how do you weave those kinds of things in? Because you might have these, as you said, you have these big action pieces, and then you have a narrative piece that might slow things down? And how, how do you build a level around those sorts of things? I mean, often when we're developing the mission and, and we've got a big paper design document, there's multiple dis disciplines who collaborate on that document. And uh, we as level designers are building like a pacing graph in, which is actually factoring in the player experience, all the highs and lows. So it's not just a a monotone experience of like you know maybe all combat or all traversal or right. all all the same experience, and then we'd bring in the the narrative guys to really make sure that what we're doing makes sense for for the narrative of the IP and contextually for the player. It aligns the goals and the, the overall vision for the game. I think um, it's really important to make sure that the the objective makes sense for a player and that they have an investment in it. So I think level design and narrative really col collaborate strongly to make sure that those two things align. Yeah. So it's an actual graph, it's like yeah, drawing an actual... Yeah, we, we kind of base it on the, the maybe the intensity of an encounter means that if it's a, a heavy combat beat, it's got a high intensity, or if it's a light combat beat, it could be a little bit of a palate cleanser. Or we could say it's an exotic beat and we, we're trying to do something completely different. Yep. Uh, or it's a traversal or a, a downbeat where something is it's going to be moody and creepy and something just collapses and you're like, oh, God, and you're, you're panicking. So it's all those things, I guess, in a way, are contributing to an overall interesting player experience. And we're trying to make sure that as the player goes through that experience, it's got that variety and, and hits the goals for, for narrative and, and all the other departments as well. It'd be super interesting to play through a mission and have a graph like that and see like, okay, this is actually happening right now. Oh my God, and then go yeah, down again. For sure. I mean, I mean, that's something I definitely do is I, I focus a lot high level because I've got an incredible team who are executing on the vision of all these different creative people and, and also in implementing their own creative vision. But I still, as a level designer, when I'm re reviewing content, I'm really keeping a considered eye for, for those kinds of things, making sure that it does have that variety and it does feel different as you're, as you're moving through and, and, and everyone is really happy. Yeah, that kind of brings us into the more nitty gritty, like how do you actually do this job? Like, right. Day to day, how do you create a level practically? Yeah. Is it, when, when you sit down first, you get, if I understood everything, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you've been receiving, these are, this is the place, these are the objectives, this is what we want to do. You have narrative that's described what's going to happen, you've worked with them to kind of set the pace. Then you're actually supposed to start doing the work itself. Yeah. Like, where do you start? I, I think, um after all that collaboration is done and you've almost created a brief or a document which is which is uh, you know focused on all the things that you want to deliver on for for that it's almost like the director's script at that point then you're trying to take that script and execute that vision 
So you could start by blocking out, like really getting in and getting your hands dirty. We say blocking out as level designers. So you'd be creating geometry within that space and, and starting to get a feel for that space coming together, mm. which could be based on a sketch that you've done or, or maybe some even jumping into SketchUp, which is almost like drawing with a 3D program. It's quite fun to use. Uh, so you, you might have sketched up or you might have sketched something with a 2D drawing and then you're starting to execute on that vision and create actual geometry that you can jump into. So we, we call it like quit to game or jump into game. You, you make some basic block out to get a sense of the scale of the environment. How long is it going to take me to run through the mission? Uh, does it have like variety in the space? Just really high level basic building blocks to mark out your space and what you're trying to achieve. And then maybe just have a run around in it and see like, is this feeling like a believable space? Can I put all the th pieces of content that I'm responsible for delivering into this space? Yep. Uh, and maybe even chatting to an artist at that point, if you've got something which is coming together fairly well de developed, maybe at a second pass block out, you've put some scale objects in to get a sense of the, the scale of the environment. You don't want to just create something without objects in it because then you won't necessarily know how big it is. Right. Uh, and then you, you bring your environment artist over and you have a bit of collaboration. He might start to think, oh, you know, maybe that here we could get rid of that wall and there's going to be a super cool vista and you could overlook it and a beautiful jungle. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. So it's kind of that collaboration then that starts to, to build more detail into the space. Uh, so it's, it's usually a combination primarily, I guess, of a level designer and a level artist collaborating to build the, the block out and geometry, but you'll also start to just block out some encounters or depending on the type of game, but it, at least primarily for me, uh, third person shooters, it would be blocking out some encounters and, and what they're going to be like in the space. Do I have room for them? Is my pacing graph matching up with the space? If I, hey, I was thinking of having a, a very heavy combat beat here, oh, but I don't have a lot of space. Is, is that going to work? Maybe I need to give myself a little more. So it's it's not getting too detailed, but starting to create the, the canvas of the geometry and, and getting an idea of how the enemies and, and all the experiences you want to craft will work in that space. Yeah, when you say boxing, it really it really is like just gray boxes sitting. Yeah, some of them having some text on it, like this is a cover, this is a box, this is a table. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I've seen some incredible blockouts in my time as a as a level designer over the years. Like some people offer more detail, other people offer less, and you know, there's a different level of of focus. Um, I've had other level designers who are incredible architecturally minded and, and they want to go a little further and then the artists are like a bit like, oh no, <laughs> like he's, uh, you don't want to tread on someone's toes. So you've got to be careful how far you push your block out as well. It's got to be within the, the realms of like your, your responsibility to the space and then the artist's responsibility to creating the, the art vision of the space. You don't want to, you don't want to take that away. No. So we're, we're quite particular about making sure when we develop a space, we're not saying that something has to be this. You don't want to create a block and then go, this is a water fountain because the artist might go, well, I don't think a water fountain makes sense there. I want it to right. be uh, a big statue of Santa Claus and, and the, someone's going to set fire to it. Yep. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I, I remember it was on Twitter, I think they did a, a whole bunch of level designers uh, did. They posted like blockouts they had worked on. It was fascinating to see kind of how levels using your mind's eye, like, okay, this is actually a waterfall. This is actually, here's can't remember if, uh, which games they were for, but like, yeah. here's the character's gonna climb here, but it's just gray, it's gray boxes, because they'll use your mind's eye to kind of get the idea of what's gonna yeah. happen there. Yeah, there's some, I mean, there's really interesting examples of, of block out, and, and then even down to the, the texturing that you use during your block out can be quite important. Uh, I think one of the, when I was working on Sniper Elite, we actually developed like a, a quite calming, pastel aesthetic to the uh, the gray box textures we were using or the block out textures we were using. And we realized that it can be a little bit kind of almost sad to look at like wall to wall gray all the time. Yeah. So you can maybe start to introduce some color f for some of the areas, but it's not 
it's just almost starting to allude to what the space would become and it becomes a bit more pleasing aesthetically on the eye but it's not you know garish in terms of the the color choice you're making you just keep it nice and soft pastel tones i think is good right but when you're working on these things as well different kinds of games like just first person and third person shooters for example yeah. is there a big difference in how you you create these spaces? Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially with the, the metrics and scale of the game. Like, uh, it's really weird the second you get a camera above a player, high, high above them, kind of like a third person camera is, or at least back and behind them, uh, you start to look at spaces very differently. Like you think a door, if you create it, is gonna be fine for a two meter character. But if you create a door to the actual width and, and of a normal door, yeah. and then you try to run through it in a, in a third person camera, it's going to feel so tight. It feels like you're almost about to collide with the top of the door as well because right. the camera's positioned a little higher. So typically, all those games have like wider doors, and we're not using the, the actual metrics of standard doors. Uh, you see some incidences of funny metric issues sometimes in, in other games as well, where it feels like you maybe they got the, the metrics a little bit off at yeah. one point, or, or the objects weren't scaled correctly, and all of a sudden you're in a space and you feel like you're maybe in like a giant's house, and you're like, the metrics of this are a little off, like something's going wrong here. Yeah. So in making these uh, blockouts in general, what kind of tools do you use? Like you mentioned 3D program, but what, yeah. what kind of tools would you sit down with generally? Uh, so we've got our own in-house tools here, uh, and there's been variations of that throughout all my time at the industry. They've always been called different things along right. the way. Uh, typically, we're working with a 3D program, which also has like a, a visual scripting component of that to manage the logic of the video game. So uh, one of the common ones, I guess, is uh, Unreal, which is used uh, as a bit of a standard. You can get your access uh, very easily as a, someone who wants to get involved in game design or level design. You could just download that at home and start using it. Uh, so it allows you, as we talked about, to create the block out geometry, but it also allows you to jump into game and, and start to move around. And then the level designer is also placing logic that is listening to where the player is and what they're doing and how they're moving through the space. So the, a good example of that is if you want to trigger maybe the lights to go out for a cinematic or an ambush or something, then you could be moving into a space and there's a volume that the player can't see, but in the level editor, we can see it and we place that volume and we know that when the player enters that volume, we can trigger logic. So we could say, I want the lights to turn out and then I just want maybe some audio to come in. It's a little bit creepy. I can hear boots on the ground, what's going on? And then, and then you know, it sets up a narrative moment that, that is going to happen and the player is going to experience a little bit of a subversive moment. Yeah. That, uh, the only kind of levels I've ever done was uh back in the day and like Neverwinter Nights and those kinds of modding tools. Right. But right. already then, like getting that feeling right, even if you just put this this corridor is a little bit too long, is a little bit too boring. Like I'm I'm walking, okay, this is a sweet spot. Here I wanted a door, but this corridor is a little too long and I'm already bored and it's gone 10 seconds? Yeah. Like how do you work with that kind of, the, the, again, we come back to the experience of fun, I guess, but how do you test these things and how do you make sure that they actually flow? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. I mean, they say at a foundation, a space sh should be fun to move around even if there isn't anything in it because ultimately it's almost the, the Mario principle of game development. Like they actually start with Mario, just as Mario running and jumping around a space. Yeah. And then before they actually develop all the levels and the rest of the game, they want that experience just to move with Mario to be incredibly fun. And, and then once it has like this level of detail associated with it, where that's amazing, now we can start to move him into a level because just moving with Mario is amazing. Yeah. So a good gray box should have a little bit of that sensibility. Like even as I'm moving around the gray box, I can get a real sense of what it's gonna become. And, and the space is like modified in interesting and exciting ways. You can get a, a sense of a journey that's happening as you're moving through it. It shouldn't just be a, a derivative series of corridors and boxes like you really want to to look at ways to move the player around in that experience that are going to be fun and interesting and exciting and, and vary the experience yep. so how do you build like in general i'm coming back to gray boxing again because i find the whole thing fascinating and looking at levels uh in general like how do you even start with these grand again coming back to realism like, how do you build, for example, there's a hotel and there's a big open area in the middle and you're supposed to have firefights over. Like, how do you, how do you practically build those kinds of environments? 
I think again, it's it's such a collaboration. So it's it's not all all on the level designer. We have such a good support network around us for that level of believability, and and particularly the artists who can come in with some incredible ideas. So I think like what I always say to my level designers is, don't be afraid of making a suggestion, um, but but ultimately the artists will like really help layer in that believability and, and the level of detail that that makes a space like really sing yep. uh, so we've we have an example where we move maybe into the the first fight in in the division uh, in the in the grand washington and you know when you when you came into that space as a block out you know all the fundamental building blocks were there like the elevation was where it needed to be to give the, the enemy an empowering place to attack and engage me and i was thinking how do i what options do I have to get the fight back on my side? Or there's a there's an escalator to the right. I'm going to go up there and and then I can flank them. That yeah. that's super cool. But like initially, it might not look like that. It'll just look like a ramp and and you know maybe there's a block here of its cover and then it becomes a grand piano and it, it starts to feel like a really believable space. Yeah. Uh, so we'll always have maybe some suggestions about like ways to to get those landmarks in and and make sure the player understands where they are. But then the collaboration is where I think it, it really sings at the end. You can really understand. Wow, this is a Super believable space uh, right. with the support of art. So and, how and everyone? Yeah, but how for you mentioned Unreal? That's a good place to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, If I'm sitting at home and I want to try this out, uh, Unreal is one yeah. good way to start. Or for sure, yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, different resources you can use uh, to to start to understand level design. Uh, if you want to get your hands do, dirty and really start to develop some block out spaces and, and then jump in and play them. Uh, definitely Unreal is a good starting point if you're at home. There's also Game Maker, which is which is good software. Uh, it's, you see a lot of pixel-based indie games using that. Uh, more of the logic side will, will be apparent when you're using that kind of software. Um, but there's so many resources as li online as well. You've got the, the world of level design is a, is a really good one uh, that, that kind of really f chews down into the process and, and some of the ways that you can level up as a level designer. Um, there's a couple of blogs and stuff as well. Yep. I've got a little cheat, cheat list here if I can reference <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead and reference. <laughs> um, I think, uh, oh yeah, I put it at the top of my list, so that, oh, that's, a, that's neglecting that. But I think game jams as well oh, yeah, uh, yeah. are really good to get involved in. Um, I think fundamentally, like uh, when you get involved in a game jam, it's so much fun and, and you're gonna have, maybe have access to other resources that you usually don't as, a, as an individual. People come together to make a game. So you're, you're straight away, you're gonna be learning so much about the process for creating a game and, and how everything comes together. Yep. I have to bring bring back those old kinds of games where, where the modding tools you're actually able to open real levels, so to speak, when you can actually when they are included in certain games and you can yep. actually open the resources and just take a look into what what goes into creating those spaces is quite amazing. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned volumes and triggers and stuff before. It's really cool to see. Like, ah, oh, okay, that's how it's. You uh, you actually reminded me. Um, we had a a gaming competition, uh, I think it was in Paris, and, and it, one of the parts of the competition was gonna be in uh, in a Far Cry deathmatch level. And then I went down to to chat to the guys who were gonna be in the competition, and then I was like, oh, let's let's get the level up and running, and, and then we can see it in the editor and start to see, like, really assess the space. And it was like trying to give them a leg up in the, in the competition, which we did win. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, it, I don't know if it helped. I mean, they were already very good players, but, being able, like you say, to see a space, see how it's created, yeah. it is really interesting and exciting. I think so. Even just doing that, if you if you have a game and it comes with modding software, to jump in and, and check out how that space was made is is a is a lot of fun, and you'll start to understand a bit about how games are made. You, you mentioned vistas before, and that's also one of the things that that struck me when opened. I think it was Dragon Age or something. I opened that up, and and you have you get a space that's just a square, and you got nothing. And then yeah. you start playing, oh, I'm going to place a building, and the player can walk in there. And all of a sudden, you realize, like, everything else is empty. So I will need to place the trees here. But then everything else is empty, so I need to place mountains. But how do I make yeah. those look good and look realistic? So how I, I guess you have to take that into account a lot as well when you talk about, like, open windows and stuff. For, for sure. Uh, particularly based on the kind of game you're making. Um, 
I think having sensibilities as a level designer for terrain editing tools is really helpful. Um, that is usually part of developing a level, particularly in a more organic space, is, is you'd be working with, like you say, maybe trees or mountains, and then there might be pockets of buildings within that, but, but it, it becomes a different experience then in terms of how you guide the player. Right. And I think it, it's really it's something you need to be careful of, like when you're making it, uh, even an organic space that you're mindful of landmarks and, and creating, if every mountain's the same height and they're all around the player, straight away I'm gonna look around or if I, I spin my mouse too quickly, I look around, oh, I'm facing a mountain. Uh, ah, like I'm a little bit lost. Yeah. There's trees and there's mountains. How do I make it so I can straight away understand where I am. Maybe there's a, a bigger mountain and you know there's a stream on my left-hand side that's guiding me through the forest and then I can start to understand very quickly where I am. Maybe the goal in front of me is is, is bigger than everything. Yeah. It, like in Journey, you know, it's this huge mountain in the distance. It's like, oh my God, I need to go there. I need to find out what is there. Yeah. Uh, so having those things come together is important. Yes, I think it was in actually in, in when I really thought about this, as you're saying, like the guiding light. I think it was in Destiny 2, there was one, at, at one point you're up on a, on a mountain, uh, there's snow everywhere, and there is like tiny little thing, like little snow that's tumbling down on your left side or something, and your attention is just drawn there straight away. Yeah. And then you realize you can walk there. Uh, it's just brilliant to see those kind of tools that you guys use too to drive the player in an intuitive way. Oh, for sure. That you don't even think about. I think, yeah, that, that's definitely part of the collaboration. That, like, particularly if you want to emphasize something, you'll speak to your lighting artist and go, hey, can, can we really like, make this area like, maybe warm or inviting or, or have a flickering light or something to draw the eye because it's important for me as a level designer that they understand this option is, is here yep. for them at, the, at their disposal. One thing that you talked with me about before, and, and, and this is not really maybe, well, it's slightly level design uh, connected. You started talking, we t started talking about foliage yeah. <laughs> before we re started to record this, because of course we have to move everything around because it needs to look pretty. Yeah. Um, you started talking about foliage guidelines that yeah. you wrote. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's an interesting part actually of, of our job as well is that we, I mean, I think level designers are quite organized in general, and, the, and they like to understand all the components that are going to affect uh, the content that they're creating. And of all the things that you, you think, you know, all these things come together in a game, but one of them is actually foliage. You know, how, does, how does foliage affect the, the player? And, mm -hmm. and what is it that they need to understand about it in the environment? And you'd be surprised, like, if you, if you make a very chaotic space with very chaotic foliage and, and, and it's just a little too much noise everywhere, how quickly it can be like too much noise for, for the player brain, they start to shut down. There's a really incredible talk from Epic's uh, Jim Brown about the importance of nothing. And he goes into how spaces themselves are almost looked at in as if you were squinting. Like if you squint in this room right now, you'll see probably like the big objects and things within the space, but you won't necessarily get a sense of all the detail. And in a <laughs> in a game, yeah, I was trying to see George, and he just completely <laughs> disappears. So. But but you've got like limited information, particularly if a lot's going on in the game. So you need to almost emulate that when you're designing a space. Like, are there things which I can see very clearly and easily? And you can imagine like if if foliage is everywhere and it's crisscrossing and it's all over the place. If you then squint, all you see is just crisscrossing lines and and chaos. So that's where, as a developer, you really need to make sure that, yeah, the importance of nothing comes into it. You're crafting a space with, like, you know, clear objects amongst it and a little bit more variety and, and that the foliage has understandability. Um, I mean, it's got a lot more knock-ons in a, in a cover-based shooter because you need to feel safe, you need to understand where you're going is gonna be cover and when I get there, people can stop shooting me because I don't wanna die. Yeah. So you don't want a, a foliage to look safe and then you go over to it and you can't interact with it or it's not stopping bullets and you're like, oh, where do I go, I'm gonna die. So we had to really create like a ground rule to make sure that like if we were ever using a foliage uh, to protect a player, that it was like a really dense, meaty looking uh, tree or shrub and, and it would believably block bullets. But then the thin spindly shrubs, they were the ones that weren't gonna stop bullets. So we had to emphasize that. We had to make sure that the artists were making them very thin, very spindly, 
and very obviously not safe right. uh, for the player. That's that, so many, like the intuitive understanding. Uh, we come yeah, back exactly. to that. It's really, yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think as a, as a player as well, there are a lot of things that are intuitively, you know, something that you're drawn to, to with certain expectations yeah. uh, about how they're going to behave or be in a game. And then if, if it's not intuitive, that's where you get friction points with the player. And they're like, hey, I tried to do this thing and the game doesn't let me. And it's like, the answer should never be like, because I say so, or because that's the design. Like, it should be more, well, if it isn't intuitive, we should try and work out how we can maybe improve that so it is. And do we want people to, to run into those friction points? Should we, should we smooth them off and make sure that the experience is, is crafted in a way that it, it's quite intuitive to play, okay. at least for players and the audience of that genre? So in short, there's a lot of different aspects. It just goes into, because if you just say level design, sometimes you're like, OK, you, you craft something that's fun to play. You put out platforms or whatever. But there's so many aspects that goes into creating these believable worlds. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, there's a, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. I think um, it's it's kind of like a, a blessing and a curse for level design that that you have, you know, this this huge responsibility, and and you are, you know, where the rubber meets the road, and you have this architecture, have you have this ability to lead the player experience. But then it's also a lot of the time when something goes wrong. Where the first people who were like in the firing line, like, what's going on with this level? So it's it's a love hate relationship sometimes with that. You need to be aware of where your responsibility is and and draw in all those resources for a collaboration. Uh, but then make sure that people are clear as well on on where your responsibility ends, so so that you don't end up in in the firing line, so to speak, right. for something that isn't necessarily your responsibility. That makes sense. You know what? Those buns smell. They, they've been there now for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm so hungry and they smell so good. Are we going to do this? You want to have some fika? I think we should do it. I think that's why we Let's get it done. Let's get it done. You, I touched that one before. You did touch that I, one. I, I, did, I, did, I was asked to fake, <laughs> fake eat this before. So yeah. you can have, Probably if you want, eat. you can have that one. That's the one I've been furthest away from. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Should you we do a little fika cheers? We, I, I, guess, I guess we could. That's, yeah, that's oh, totally normal. These are, oh God, you smell pretty good. They're, Thanks, man. They're, they're one, well, you brought them. Oh, yeah. In theory. <laughs> I brought them. Dead. These are not props. <laughs> I, I'm glad. But thank you very much for coming. I'm going to finish you with first. And then I'm going to say thank you very much for coming and giving us some insight into how level design actually works. Thank you very much, man. No, it's my pleasure, man. <laughs> well, we're doing that as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining our Fika today. We've left a whole bunch of useful links in the description, so make sure to check those out if you want to learn more. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that fun stuff you do on the internet. Until next time, take care.